The Butcher of Ark, Chapter 6, The Silver Cloud One of Callion's skills that I never learned to understand was to get by without almost no sleep. During our journey, he went to bed late after midnight and he always managed to be awake before me, mostly long before dusk. He had a strict morning routine. It started with a half hour long prayer in a language that I did not understand. Then he practiced with his scimitar for a good hour and a bit longer on two days of the week. After that, he took a bath or when there was no river or lake nearby, sprinkled some water over himself. Finally, he prepared a breakfast of cereal pulp mixed with bitter herbs, which he meditatively devoured as if all mysteries of the Pyrenees were hidden in it. I guess he only slept a maximum of 4 hours per night and I wondered how he managed to look healthy and energetic like after a bath in the waters of the Innerden. On our journey he had let me sleep but on our first day in Ark he woke me up early in the morning. My limbs felt leaden after the night of carousing. For a moment my sleepy gaze tried to find the water trough that I had used to wash myself in every morning in Fogville. But then I recognized where I was. I groaned, hove myself out of bed and looked outside. By the path, how late is it? There was no sign of the sun yet. As if he had read my thoughts, Callian answered my question. Two more hours before the cocks crow, my friend. Before you say anything, he was just about to strap his sword to his waist. It is necessary. We have an appointment. I wanted to answer, but only a sullen murmur left my mouth. Callian continued. Meet me in an hour in front of the last house of the Cloud Alley. I will wait for you there. He left the room before I was able to reply anything. For a moment, I was baffled and kept sitting on the edge of my bed. Then I stood up with a sigh and went over to the window. Absent-mindedly, I looked over the roofs of the sleeping city. No cloud hit the silver light of the moon, and despite the early hour, there were several people on the streets. I withdrew into myself. In fact, I felt quite well despite the headache that was a result of inebriation. I rarely thought about the events in the Red Ox anymore, but now I remembered Callian's words. You have felt their crimes and their guilt, and the ecstasy was the reward for your courage. It was the nectar of their sins. Could this be the reason why the murder left me cold? Because it was justified? I thought, please not. And I thought, something good. Uttering a cheerful and at the same time depressed and desperate sound, I shook away the thoughts. Instead, I looked at the activity below. I saw three emaciated children carrying heavy sacks along the big streets that led across Ark. Directly behind them, three armored figures, most likely guards, were patrolling. Two women, one of them big and muscular, the other one slim, were pulling a wheelbarrow with a barrel and three bundles of hay into an alley that led to the rear exit of the tavern. Full of thoughts, I turned away from the window and got dressed. After I had eaten a meal in the tap room, I started on my way, feeling a mixture of curiosity and anxiousness. I do not want to bore you with unnecessary details of my first journey through Ark, for you probably know where the street was situated. I did not know then. Only after a guard eyed me suspiciously and pointed me towards a half decayed warehouse, I realized where I was and that I had arrived 15 minutes before the appointed time. Cloud Alley, as the builders of the city had named it, without any apparent reason, marked the end of the artisan squatter. It was the way which led to the large stone gate that every decent upper town citizen hoped never to enter. It marked the entry to the Undercity. I looked around insecurely. I knew about the Undercity from countless stories, including Callians. It was a place to be avoided unless one was dealing with concealers or criminals, 
all living in such poverty that one of the shabby huts down there was the only affordable home. Regardless of how I had imagined the contrast between the beautiful capital and the misery of the undercity, my thoughts always included a kind of transition between pos prosperity and poverty, but there did not seem to be such a thing. Looking up, I saw the impressive Myra Tower, where wealthy travelers arrived in the city or departed to other places on the amphenous winged animals. Next to me, a large waterfall came pouring down, and if I had walked up the small alley again on which I had left the winding marketplace a few minutes ago, I would have found myself in the heart of the artisan squatter. Irritated, I, looked ag I again looked at the wooden door, which was guarded by two heavily armed men. Was this door really the entrance to the other unpleasant world? I felt a hand on my shoulder. Callion. You found it! Very well, he said. Are you ready? I screwed up my eyes. I now knew that my first lesson had to do with the Undercity. But what exactly was expecting me? I think so. And what are we going to do? Callion chuckled. <laughs> Quite simple, my friend. He took the knapsack from his shoulders, went down to his knees and started to search for something. Then he looked up to me again. We are going to have some fun. My doubts that the Undercity was indeed behind the large guarded wooden door vanished a few moments after the guards had granted us entry. They must think that we are crazy, I thought as both wings of the door swung open. No citizen of the upper town went there voluntarily, for it was well known that the Order and the Guard were virtually powerless down there. Inofficially, everyone knew about the silent agreement between the Order and the Relatha, the association of shady characters. You stay among yourselves, and we stay among ourselves. Therefore, the Undercity was a town within the town. And it was much gloomier than the Ark Overground with its rustic, cozy, half-timbered houses, fountains and theatres. Down there, the Relata controlled every aspect of life, and whoever was unfortunate enough to live there, no matter if they wanted or not, had to bow to them. Shuddering, I remembered what a travelling merchant once had told me. His story revolved around a young tradesman who only a few months before had received the coveted badge of the Golden Sickle, which denoted him as a sound businessman. This young man wanted to take the short road to wealth, and with the help of a few low lads from Ark, he started to collect glimmer cap dust. Its production was more or less an official privilege of the Relata, yet this fact did not keep the young man from sending the group of unsuspecting boys to a cave near the west coast to begin his own unobstructive, as he believed, trade with a deadly narcotic. For almost a moon's turn, business went well, and his purse was filled faster than the mugs of a popular tavern. One morning, however, when he rode to the grotto where the mushrooms were collected, he found it deserted. There was only a cart with four man-sized baskets in front of the entrance and the baskets were filled to the top with glimmer cap mushrooms, but they emitted a strange odor. When the merchant told his bodyguard to shovel the contents out on the ground, different body parts rolled out of each of the baskets. Arms, legs, torsi, heads. The heads had been cut off carefully so that there was no doubt about their owners. Five of them belonged to the unfortunate boys who he had who had been hired by the merchant for a mother's earning. Two of the heads belonged to the merchant's daughters, and the eighth one was his companion's head. On her forehead, the following words had been carved in. Sharim Ralata. The Ralata does not forget. They let the merchant live. He was never again seen in the Golden Sickle Guild House, and rumor has it that he took his own life a few months later. Thus ended the old traveling's merchant story. And now, we are here. I felt uneasy. Everything about us screamed upper town and wealth. Our gestures, our expensive clothes, Callion's dagger. 
Behind the door, stairs led down into the darkness. It took us more than 50 minutes before we encountered a sign of human life. The air was cold and humid. It smelled like ammonia, mold and wet stones. We came to the end of the long stone stairway. Wooden planks marked a path that led into a tunnel that was about 30 arms length high. The first hut we passed had been built so tightly into a natural corner of the rocks that I hardly perceived it. Mighty, rusty ducts came out of the walls and disappeared into the floor, winding around the brittle pieces of wood that the house was constructed of. Chests and barrels, some of them broken, were piled up at the walls that were not bordered by the stone of the cavern. Meanwhile, more and more inhabitants had noticed our presence. Some of them looked at us with suspicion and swiftly turned their gaze away, and others bluntly stared at us. While we passed more huts, we even saw constructions for, with roofs in front of them, probably something like market stalls. Fish, spices, unhealthily looking bread and other wares were displayed on them. Callion did not seem to mind the people's gazes. He accelerated his pace and disappeared behind a corner. I followed him and what I saw took my breath away. Before me was a vast cavern with a ceiling so high that two guard towers on top of each other could have been fit in it. Stalactites hung from the ceiling like icicles of stone. In the distance, an impressive waterfall was pouring out of the crag. Throughout the cavern, houses of dark wood were erected on platforms, connected by stairs and bridges, supported by piers and natural stone pillars. The houses became increasingly higher towards the walls of the cave so that the scenery was reminiscent of a gigantic amphitheater. In the center, the buildings were erected on the bare stone floor. In form and appearance, they differed from the houses on the platforms. I saw a stone building that, with its high roof and pointy tower, looked like a small temple. A dozen arms lengths next to it was a multi-story building. It was also made of stone and its windows emitted a reddish, milky glow. Numerous people were bustling about and even though I had a good look over the round, open space that most likely was the center of the subterranean city, it was so dark that I could barely make out silhouettes. The Undercity, a name well deserved. A BV man passed by and bumped into me and suddenly rousing me from my thoughts. I sighed and wiped the sweat from my forehead that had accumulated there despite the cold air. Then I looked for Callion, who had walked ahead. I found him at the foot of a stairway beneath a leafless crooked tree. He was talking to someone. Hastily I went down the stairs. As I came close to them, the stranger pointed towards me and Callion made a placating gesture. Only when I came closer, I realized that it was a woman. Her hair was short and blonde, a stark contrast to her soft face with full red lips. However, her eyes... I felt something glow in my stomach, protesting, angry. Her eyes were eyes cold blue, so lurid that they seemed to shine even in the faint light of the cavern. Even though they were objectively beautiful, they aroused a feeling in me which I was unable to analyze. They appeared cold. Before I was able to consider the voice that sounded inside me again, Callion started to speak. JL! May I introduce you? He pointed at the young woman with his open hand, his palm direct upwards. This is Yelena. I tried to respond, but I failed. Yelena has examined me shortly, from head to toe, and then turned her gaze away from me. He seems to be going to pee his pants. Are you absolutely sure it's not too late yet? Callion smiled charmingly and nodded. I am, and you can trust him. You have my word. The woman bit her lips and furrowed her eyebrows. Then she returned Callion's nod. Very well, let's go. We started to move. Maybe it was only my imagination, but I had the impression that the number of hateful looks around us had increased. The air and the darkness in the cavern suddenly felt even heavier. Callion looked at me over his shoulder. There was no trace of fear or uneasiness in his eyes. In a certain way, they even gleamed with anticipation, 
But why? I was aware of the fact that there were many shifty people around here, yet we seemed Callion and our guide to be so familiar with each other. Our destination was a dark alley directed next to the multi-story house with the red windows. A sign at the entrance identified it as the Silver Cloud. Determinedly, the woman stepped into the dark and we followed her. There was absolute darkness in the shadows of the buildings and my uneasiness grew when I saw that our guide at the end of the alley walked into an even smaller one. This is a labyrinth and damn a dangerous one. There were no people, only heaps of rubbish and puddles of feces. There were only two encounters. First we saw two men warming themselves at the campfire. As Yelena saw and saw the fire from afar, she accelerated her steps and kicked one of the men at his head with full force. He uttered a choked cry and fell down, while the other man, terrified, tried to raise himself up against the wall. Yelena did not allow him to. She bent towards him, holding her face close to the face of the beggar and murmured something about open fire, Ali and the siblings. Then she dashed him to the ground and told us to move on. Our second encounter with human beings in this dark subterranean maze was with a figure that was draped in sheets, leaning on the wall of a house. I barely recognized her because of her failing. As I passed by, however, she grabbed my thigh with her bony fingers. I uttered a cry and turned around. She removed the sheet that was covering her head, revealing a face hardly older than my own, but covered by festering, pulsating ulcers. Meat maggots. She whispered something which sounded like a craving plea, but only a guttural rattling noise left her mouth. Jerkily, I withdrew my leg from her claw and hurried after Callion and Yelena. When we finally arrived, after what felt like an eternity, I was exhausted, as if I had been briskly wandering for a day. I feared never to get rid of the disgusting odor that stuck on me. Yelena halted at a thick steel door and knocked twice. A few moments later, a hatch opened and two eyes and the brushy brows looked outside. As they recognized our leader, I heard the noise of a creaky latch and the door opened. The door guard was an unremarkable man with choppy hair who, who reminded me of myself in an unpleasant manner. He looked at us appraisingly, but his gestures showed that he was Yelena's subordinate. With relief, I noticed that the building unlike I expected because of its exterior, was clean and lit by several candlesticks on the walls. There was even a slight scent of lavender in the air, which after the omnipresent odor of feces during the last hours seemed to me like the smell of Yolanda's hair. Without any conversation, Callion and I were guided along a narrow corridor with numerous closed doors. Despite the dim light that came forth from underneath them, they seemed oppressive to me like holding cell doors. At the end of the corridor, Yalina opened another door. The room in front of us was impressive. It was decorated with fine furniture and pillows and a chandelier at the ceiling emitted soft orange light. There was a haze in the air and as I was looking over the low tables that were surrounded by hassocks, I realized where the scent of lavender came from. Altogether, there were seats for about two dozen people but except for us, the door guard and Yelena, only three other guests sat separately at the tables, drinking wine and smoking water pipes. Soothing harp music came from a corner of the room that was hidden from my view. I started to feel more comfortable again. Maybe this was indeed just a smoker's tavern? Perhaps an exclusive place for even more exclusive customers. Why the exclusive customers should take the troublesome way through the alleys just to smoke a few pipes of peace with, with 11 ascent, I could not tell. I pursed my lips and looked helplessly at Callion. He only smiled contently and slightly nodded towards me. Have a seat, Yelena said, and she pointed at an empty table in the corner. Then she silently moved away behind a curtain and the door guard went back to the entrance. I wanted to say something, but Callion indicated me to wait. We sat down. Furtively, I looked around and mustered the other guests. Two men, one of them young, the other one old, and an old woman who wore her hair in a bun. Judging by their clothes, 
They all were wealthy, like ourselves. None of them took notice of us. Kalyan took one of the candles on our table and held it underneath the pot of the water pipe. Then he leaned back. Our pillows lay next to a wall and yawned cheerfully. He observed the water pipe with a merry and relaxed gaze. In the pot, bubbles began to emerge slowly. For a while, I did the same as him. Then I decided to break the silence. Kalyan, he cut off my words with a gesture and shook his head, almost leniently. Just relax, my friend. With one hand, he touched the pot of the water pipe. Relax. We waited more than 30 minutes before a chubby man with a friendly smile approached us. He introduced himself as Conthis. The first thing I noticed was that the left sleeve was of his expensive looking burgundy garment hung limply down. He was one armed. As he put out his right hand in greeting, I noticed several shimmering rings on his meaty fingers. A surprisingly pleasant smell reached my nose, originating from his perfume. It was spicy and sweet. Please excuse the delay, he started the conversation with a dark, bassy voice that did not match his appearance. We have many customers today. May I have a seat? Callion answered in an affirmative to the pleasantry, and Confis sat down opposite to us. For a while, none of us said anything, and I felt how Confis's dark, perceptive eyes mustered me. Then he nodded contently. Well then, formally first. He took a folded parchment out of his garment and opened it and studied it shortly. Jariamon Bathila, 46 winters old, merchant, and... Ah, you come from Araziel? Gosh, may I say that your Andralian is very good? The question seemed to refer to Kalyan, and he smiled. Skill comes with practice, I guess. Contis nodded. Indeed, it does. And then there is J.L. Thalas. A alien as well. I nodded and tried to smile as charmingly as Callion. Very well. He followed the parchment again and leaned slightly forward. Then we begin. Agreed? Callion blew out the smoke upwards from the corner of his mouth. Like all consumers of pea sweet, he had slightly misty eyes, but he nevertheless seemed to have a clear mind. Please, he replied. For completeness, let me once again explain the rules and the procedure of your visit. We will hopefully not be your last. His voice was friendly, but I could sense a certain sharpness in it. As soon as you have paid the rest, a servant will... We have to pay before we receive the services? Kalin seemed to be indignant. Those are the rules, Matris. I'm sorry, Contest replied, without lowering his gaze. Callion looked sourly at the burly man, yet he made an affirmative gesture. Confess smiled. Well now, a servant will give you a sign and then accompany you to the, your chambers. He looked at the parchment again, or rather, your chamber. The girls will be waiting there. Whatever happens next will be up to you. The girls? A shudder went down my spine and I gave Callion a nervous gaze. Contest had noticed my gaze. Are you well, Matris? He asked. Before I could answer, Callion spoke. Ah, oh, he is just a little excited. He looked at me re reprovingly. It is his first time. Contest frowned. Well, I understand. As soon as you are done, ring the bell on the nightstand. Wait a few moments and then ring again. And someone will take care about... He seemed to struggle for a word. The rest. And that would be it. He let his gaze wander between Kalyan and me. Are there any more questions from your side? Kalyan had a question. I assume we will leave this place the same way we came in? Yes. Yelena will accompany you outside. My comrade muttered suddenly. I see. And you can guarantee it for our... Anonymity? Contest gave a short laugh. <laughs> we can guarantee that nobody except for our attendants will have seen you arrive and leave this place. And you can be certain that the other guests have no interest in talking about your presence. I think I do not need to explain why. Callion shortly rubbed his chin with his thumb and index finger. He seemed to think. 
and then he nodded and put out his strong hand to Contis. Accepted. We have a deal. Contis smiled happily. First he shook Callion's hand, then mine. His handshake was strong and firm. Afterwards, Callion took a small bulging purse from his coat and emptied it on the table. Fifteen gold coins. You can count them if you like. My eyes widened. Fifteen gold coins? What a fortune! One gold coin was worth one thousand pennies. One thousand pennies. Enough to buy a decent house or a war horse of the finest breed. My head was spinning as I thought of the things one could purchase for a sum of fifteen times higher than that. Yet Callion kept a straight face while he was looking at the shimmering gold. Did these riches come from the treasuries of Callion's mysterious brothers and sisters? They probably did. I uneasily turned my gaze from the coins and looked at our host, who was looking at them contently. It will not be necessary. He waved his hand and a lanky boy who wore a red garment came in from between two curtains. His head was bowed in humility. As he had reached our table, Contus only pointed towards the coins. He collected them swiftly and silently and carried them away. After he had disappeared behind the curtains, Contus spoke again. Well then, indulge yourselves. Callion smiled and blew out a cloud of smoke. Thank you. Without further words, Converse stood up and left. After only five minutes, the curtains opened again and the slim boy indicated us to follow him. Callion nodded shortly and took a last draw on the pipe. I noticed uneasily that he had almost smoked two full pots of pea sweet, an amount that could put a cocky, unexperienced bachelor to a comatose slumber for several hours. Callion, however, did not seem to be tired. His eyes had a milky shimmer, characteristic of peas with consumers, and all of his movements were calm. But also I saw the strange, intimidating glimmer in his eyes that I had noticed on that evening when he told me about the nectar of sins. We raised and walked through the room and towards the boy. Even when we stood directly before him, he did not look up but still bowed his head towards the ground. He turned around and we followed him to the long corridor that opened behind the curtains. Similar to the hallway which led me from the entrance area to the parlor, every eight arms length there were heavy steel doors at both sides. Each door had a number up of its arc, written on a wickedly expensive looking golden badge. We stopped in front of door number 16. Silently the boy removed the heavy key from a large ring and thus thrust it into Callion's hands. Then he bowed shortly, turned around and left. Callion played with the keys like a prestigenator and then inserted it into the lock. The door opened without noise. The room was ample and luxurious. A chandelier emitted candlelight which was colored by a red paper screen. A pompous canopy bed stood in the middle and the air strongly smelled of roses and lavender. Even before I noticed the two bound girls, a cold shudder went down my spine as I entered the room behind Callion, and the heavy door snapped shut. And before Callion could inform me about the services this place provided, the pieces came together and formed a coherent, terrible whole. I looked around, overwhelmed. My gaze jumped between the different unambiguous elements of room 16. The bound girls on the bed, stark naked their eyes undoubtedly clouded by a narcotic. The box on the small table containing angular kernels, which I instantly identified as those of holly berries. Even a baker woman from old lower Aranth knew about their aphrodisiac effects. Finally, the utensils hanging on the walls. Do you like it? Callion asked. He sat down on a sprawling arrangement of burgundy hassocks. He was barely an arm's length away from the bound girls on the bed, yet he did not look at them at all. In the corners of his mouth, I still saw the smile that never seemed to cease. We are going to have some fun. Monster, I thought, bewildered. Without a word, I attacked Callion. With a loud cry, I jumped forward, launched myself on him and started to strangle him. Callion seemed not to have expected it, and for a moment, I thought I had the upper hand. Then, however, 
he started to laugh. Or he tried to. The result was a choking rattle. Full of rage, I increased the pressure, while my face turned into a hateful grimace. But Callian just kept on laughing. His eyes were gleaming of joy and amusement. If I had watched the scene without being part of it myself, I probably would have considered it a fake and exhibition fight. He made no effort to free himself from my grasp. You miserable bastard! You damn piece of dirt! I pressed harder. I felt the stubbles of Callian's beard prick on my fingers as I squeezed his warm flesh. Yet nothing happened. Callian still laughed, and only after 60 seconds I realized that any normal human being should have been unconscious by now. Yet it did not happen. Nothing happened at all. After a while, Callian's laughter broke off, but not because I had killed him. His face, which had not even turned red, began to show the expression of blissful serenity again. Suddenly, I felt helpless and ridiculous. I had never seen Callian fight, but since the day we had met, I had felt the aura of power which surrounded him like a veil of heat surrounded an open fire. He was dangerous. I took fright. He could kill me, shot through my head. Once, twice, again and again, like a gloomy drum roll. He could kill me. But I won't, Callian said. His lips did not move a bit. Then he put his right hand on my chest, and one second later, I was thrown back, as if a cannonball had hit me. I hit the stone floor hard, and lost consciousness. <laughs>